physiotherapy to increase lung volume. Introduction to respiratory physiotherapy. What is respiratory physiotherapy and does it work? Respiratory physiotherapy to be effective includes education, pain relief, accurately targeted mobilization, manual and mechanical techniques and response to patients in distress. It is ineffective to intervene with the process as personal as breathing without attention to the person as a whole. Other aids to effectiveness are to avoid the routine and to ensure that any improvement achieved is maintained. Ongoing management includes a negotiated plan of self-care and liaison with nursing staff or relatives. Brief follow-up checkups during the day may be appropriate rather than ticking off the patient's name in a notebook. One of the physiotherapist's most useful skills is in motivating patients especially by providing positive feedback and encouraging patients own ideas. A suggested approach is to assess the patient, identify the problems, clarify the patient's expectations, negotiate goals, agree on management plan and time frame, treat the patient, reassess, discuss and modify the plan according to the ongoing assessment, check if the goals are met. Goals should be specific, meaningful to the patient and challenging but achievable. Patients who have difficulty communicating or who are on ventilator can still be involved with decisions on treatment. For helpless patients, a degree of autonomy is particularly important. Physiotherapy usually includes advice which should be explicit, short, clear, written down and copied for physiotherapy notes. The next three chapters will relate techniques to the available evidence using the three main respiratory problems of reduced lung volume, increased work of breathing and sputum retention. What is loss of lung volume and does it matter? Loss of lung volume takes a variety of forms. Atlectasis is collapse of anything from a few alveoli to the whole lung. Segmental low bar and lung collapse are visible radiographically but microatelectasis is not obviously detectable. Causes include shallow breathing, bronchial obstruction, absorption of trapped gas, surfactant depletion and compression from abdominal distension or pleural disorder. Atelectasis has been reported in 74% of patients with acute spinal cord injury, 85% with neuromuscular disease, up to 90% of patients with after cardiac surgery and 25% of patients after up to upper abdominal surgery. Physiotherapy is indicated to treat or prevent atelectasis if it is caused or anticipated by immobility, poor pos positioning, mucus plug, shallow breathing and or post-operative pain especially in non-alert patients. Consolidation causes a loss of functioning, lung volume. It is not directly responsive to physiotherapy but in a dehydrated patient it is responsive to hydration and further complication may be prevented by positioning or mobilization. Pleural effusion, pneumothorax and abdominal distension compress the lung but are inaccessible directly to physiotherapy. Positioning may assist comfort and gas exchange and sometimes re-expansion of the lung may need assistance, example after a pleural effusion has been drained. Restrictive disorders of the lung or chest wall reduce lung volume but are less responsive to physical treatment. Even when the condition is not directly responsive to physiotherapy, the patient may still need attention. When increasing the lung volume, the distribution of the extra air should be directed to poorly ventilated lung regions. In post-operative or immobile patients, this is usually the lower lobes. Loss of lung volume is a problem when it causes a significant degree of decreased surface area for gas exchange, decreased lung compliance, increased work of breathing.
controlled mobilization the most fruitful technique for increasing lung volume is exercise when accurately targeted this combines upright posture which reduces pressure on the diaphragm and encourages basal distribution of air with natural deep breathing it is the first line treatment for patients who can get out of bed to ensure accuracy the level of activity is controlled so that the patient becomes just slightly breathless but avoids muscle tension then he is asked to lean back against a wall to get his or her breath back while being discouraged from talking which would upset the breathing rhythm relaxing against the wall minimizes postural activity of the abdominal muscles allowing the diaphragm to descend more freely the controlled slight breathlessness then becomes therapeutic as deep breathing rather than wasted as shallow apical breathing for patients who have not just had surgery some find that holding their hands behind their backs while leaning against the wall further frees their breathing patients who are not able to walk can use controlled activity by simply transferring from bed to chair then they get their breath back by relaxing against the back of the chair even less ambitiously when bed bound patients have simply rolled into side lying they can be encouraged to relax in the appropriate position while returning to normal tidal breathing once patients understand these principles and can identify the feeling of slight breathlessness and getting getting their breath back they can practice on their own using walking and their normal functional activities as a medium for improving lung volume regular graded exercise can then be encouraged and monitored by the physiotherapist principles of safety when mobilizing patients are the following check brakes on beds chairs and wheelchairs place chairs strategically in advance supported against a wall place chairs on stair landings if there is space watch intravenous lines ensure that patients dangle their legs over the edge of the bed for a period before standing avoid holding a patient's arm if it is being used for walking aid ensure that patients keep their hands out of their pockets for the first 24 hours after surgery watch the patient's face for color change that might indicate postural hypertension caused by preoperative fluid restriction and postoperative uh, perioperative fluid shifts discourage breath holding encourage steady relaxed breathing when sitting a patient in a chair or wheelchair add extra stability by tucking a foot behind a chair leg or wheel stand below the patient when going up or down stairs if a patient falls hospital manual handling protocol should be followed but it is the patient's head that is vulnerable and it can sometimes be held against the physiotherapist for protection during the fall positioning changing a patient's position may not seem a dramatic procedure but this simple action often prevents a recourse to more time consuming techniques that can be tiring for the patient positioning should be an integral part of all respiratory care especially when prophylaxis is the aim it is used in its own right or in conjunction with other techniques no physiotherapy treatment should be carried out without consideration of the position in which it is performed positioning affects several aspects of lung function lung volume is related to the displacement of the diaphragm and abdominal contents functional residual capacity decreases from standing to slumped sitting McNaughton found that FRC can drop by up to 1 liter from standing to the supine position. Lung compliance decreases and work of breathing increases progressively from standing to sitting to supine. In supine, lung volume is restricted by the load of the viscera, increased thoracic blood volume and small airway closure. 
Vaba found that WOB was 40% higher in supine than in sitting. Despite compensatory hypoxic vasoconstriction, a degree of perfusion persists in areas of low volume which increases shunt. Arterial oxygenation is usually higher in sideline than supine. With bilateral or diffuse pathology, this tends to be slightly greater lying on the right than the left because of reduced compression of the heart. Recumbency impairs fluid regulating mechanisms leading to orthostatic intolerance and reduced motivation to mobilize because of lightheadedness. Supine is unhelpful for lung volume because the diaphragm is inefficient and less coordinated with chest fall mechanics. The slumped position is unhelpful because of pressure against the diaphragm from the abdominal contents. The following principles apply to immobile or relatively immobile patients with atelectasis or potential atelectasis. Time should be spent in sideline well forward so that the diaphragm is free from abdominal pressure. Sideline can also be encouraged for sleeping. A two hourly position change has been recommended. Half lying in bed rapidly becomes the slumped position for most patients as they slide down the bed. Time in half lying should be limited for patients with loss of lung volume unless necessary for a specific medical reason or to minimize pain. Side lying position, the patient has an acutely distended abdomen but the diaphragm is relieved of pressure by the patient being rolled well forward. Maneuvers to increase volume such as deep breathing are relatively ineffective in half lying because of pressure from abdominal viscera. When sitting out a patient after treatment, a footstool may be inadvisable unless the patient has ankle edema or a recent vein graft or finds this position more comfortable. Lengthy positioning in supine is best avoided for those who have a high closing volume, example people who are elderly obese or smoke heavily. Positioning also affects the VQ ratio. Ventilation and perfusion are usually matched because the better ventilated dependent lung is also better perfused. For people with one-sided pneumonia, reduced ventilation on the affected side overrides the physiological ventilation gradient. Lying with the affected lung uppermost means that the Better ventilation of the dependent normal lung is matched with better perfusion. Perfusion is always greater in dependent areas and VAQ match is therefore enhanced in the bad lung up position sometimes resulting in a dramatic improvement in gas exchange. VAQ is usually mismatched if the affected lung is dependent. As well as optimizing gas exchange, the bad lung up rule suits other situations. It promotes comfort following thoracotomy or chest drain placement, facilitates postural drainage and helps improve lung volume when atelectactic lung is positioned uppermost to encourage expansion. With atelectasis, the uppermost areas are stretched and better expanded even though the dependent lung may be better ventilated because of the compressed alveoli having greater potential to expand and take in fresh gas. Exceptions to the bad lung up rule are recent pneumonectomy, large pleural effusion, bronchopleural fistula in, in case any unsavory substances drain into unaffected dependent lung. Occasionally if there is a large tumor in a main stem bronchus when positioning the patient with the affected side uppermost may obstruct the bronchus and cause breathlessness. Any situation in which the oximeter or patient comfort indicates otherwise. The above are guidelines only and patient need individual assessment. 
After treatment, the physiotherapist should explain to nursing staff why the patient has been left in a specific position and th that this should be maintained until the patient wants to move or it is time to turn. Night staff should be included in training on positioning. Oximetry is useful to demonstrate the effectiveness of positioning to both patient and staff. Accurate positioning and a regular position change should be incorporated into a patient's management plan 24 hours a day.